Hello and welcome to topic four, lecture one. And topic four is dedicated to learning about the free exercise of religion. Okay, so as I mentioned last week, we are finally getting started on examining specific civil liberties. And we start our examination with religious liberties. Um, and so as you'll notice with the First Amendment, the first liberties that are protected or mentioned within the First Amendment are the religious liberties. And so um, we spent two weeks taking a look at religious liberties. Um, in, in this week, we're going to be taking a look at the free exercise of religion. And next week, we're going to be learning about the establishment. Um, uh, or the disestablishment of religion, the separation of the church from the state. Um, and so this is an overview of what you're going to be learning about in topic four. Um, we're going to set the stage with taking a look at the First Amendment religious clauses, and we're going to talk about the difference between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Um, then we're going to ask the question, why were the framers so concerned with religious liberties? You'll notice in the First Amendment that the first liberty is not about speech, or it's not about the press, or it's not about the right to assemble, but it's about religion. Um, so what was so important when it comes to religious liberties for the framers? And when we answer, in answering that question, we're going to see that the, why the framers were concerned about religious liberties has to do with um, the makeup of religion in the United States. Both, both the um, religious landscape of the past, um, so the religious landscape of the the colonies and the early states and that we also see because religion has been protected in the constitution that it gives us it, it informs the, the 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 religious landscape of the contemporary united states so we're going to be taking a look at that um we're going to define religion uh and we're also going to look at the what the supreme court calls the belief action distinction and so since religion is protected, well, we have to say, is what is religion? If somebody's acting and motivated by their religious beliefs, well, then, you know, those actions get protected. Uh, but how do we know if what is motivating a person's action is actually a religious motivation? So we'll take a look at how the Supreme Court has um, dealt with that. And then uh, in, in, in this topic, we're going to be taking a look at the free exercise clauses, um, uh, the tests that the Supreme Court has um, developed to help us understand the free exercise clause and how it applies to the actions of the government. So there's a lot to cover in this, in this chapter. Um, there's going to be three lectures uh, for topic four, more than usual, but that's just because there is so much material to cover. And, and so in the yellow is what we're going to be covering in the first lecture in the blue is what we're going to be covering in the second lecture and the pink is what we're going to be looking at in the third lecture so let's go ahead and get started okay so here is the text of the first amendment and um it you know you're familiar with it at this point in the semester um but it reads that congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And those are the two clauses, uh, religious clauses. Uh, the first in yellow is known as the establishment clause and in the blue is the free exercise clause. So let's look at what those clauses actually mean. Okay, so when we're talking about the Establishment Clause, we're basically talking about the relationship between the church and the state. Um, in other words, that, you know, that, you know, what relationship can the government have to religious institutions? And what the Supreme Court has told us, and we'll learn more about this, um, you know, when we move towards next week, is that the Establishment Clause is basically saying that the government cannot enact laws which aid one or all religions or give preference to one religion over the other. The Establishment Clause is about this wall that separates church and state, this wall that separates government from religious institutions. The Free Exercise Clause has to do with an individual's right to practice their religion. And so the Free Exercise Clause protects the individual's right to believe and practice whatever religion one chooses, but it also protects one's individual right not to practice religion as well. Um, and so when it comes to the Free Exercise Clause, it's, a, it, it's telling government what they can't do. Again, civil liberties, it's the thou shall not. And it's basically saying that, it, you know, that the Free Exercise Clause is saying that 
that government cannot forbid someone from exercising their religious beliefs. They can't pass laws that say that you can't go to church or that you can't pray or that you can't wear some religious garb, etc. Okay, um, we're going to see during the course of this week that it's just not as easy as it sounds, right? But that's the main difference between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Okay, so here's a little exercise for you to see if you can sort of differentiate between whether or not these cases that we're going to put on the side side deal with the Establishment Clause or deal with the Free Exercise Clause. So I'm going to put up a list of sort of hypothetical cases on the side there. Um, and I want you to ask yourself, okay, what is at issue? Um, is the state attempting to establish a religion? Is the state trying to benefit one religion, support one religion, support all religions, right? Um, in other words, is the state trying to get involved in the business of religion? And then that would deal with the establishment clause. Or is what is issued the state attempting to limit or regulate an individual's practice of their religion? Then it would deal with the free exercise clause. So let me put the cases up here and then you can pause the video and then we'll come back together. And then when you pause the video, you could sort of say, ask yourself, hey, I, you know, this is the establishment clause. This is the free exercise clause. Then we'll come back together and we'll see how well you did. Okay, so the first one is, state law mandates that creationism be taught in public high school biology classes okay um does that deal with the establishment clause or the free exercise clause and just to you know make sure that we're all on the same page here um teaching uh creationism is basically the um, biblical story of the origins of humans um that is that uh humans are um are, uh, originate from god uh, the second is uh, that tax dollars are given as vouchers to parents and they can be used to send their child to religious school. Um, and so is that having to do with the Establishment Clause, the Free Exercise Clause, neither, both? Uh, how about state law prohibits the handling of venomous snakes by non-animal experts? You might say, well, what does that have to do with religion? Well, there are some religions that basically say that, um, you know, if you are um, in, in imbued with the Holy Spirit, that it will protect you from really bad things. In fact, it will protect you from being um, bit by a venomous snake. And so the practice of ha snake handling is a, is a religious practice. So kind of hint, hint there for you. Churches are exempt from paying local property taxes. And the final one is the correctional facilities must provide sweat lodges for Native American prisoners. All right, there are the cases. Pause the video and see if you can figure out, is this an establishment clause case or this is this a free exercise clause case? Okay, so welcome back and let's see um, how you did. All right, so the first one, state law mandating that creationism be taught in high school, public high school biology classes. Um, does that deal with the establishment clause or the free exercise clause? Well, if you had the establishment clause, you are correct. Um, this is an instance where state, the state is basically endorsing a particular religious perspective, okay? And it's saying that it must be taught in the public schools, right? Um, and so, you know, the state mandating a religious doctrine is that intermingling of the church and the state. And we'll find out in the second half of ch chapter four, whether or not the state mandating the teaching of creationism violates the establishment clause, but it deals with the establishment clause. Number two, Tax dollars are given as vouchers to parents and parents can use that money to send their child to a religious school. Is that a free exercise case or is that establishment clause case? Well, as we're gonna be learning next week, it is an establishment clause case. Why? Well, it's an establishment clause case because public tax dollars are, are being funneled to pay for tuition to go to a religious school. And so in a way, it's like the intermingling of the church and state. Um, now it is going through parents. And so, you know, one might say, hey, it's a parent making the decision. So it's not really the state that's intermingling with the church. Um, and we'll see, uh, you know, we're going to read the case that deals with that issue about whether or not vouchers um, being sent to religious schools violates the establishment clause. 
How about a state law prohibiting the handling of venomous snakes by non-animal experts? That deals with the free exercise clause. Somebody is exercising their religious belief. Their religious belief is I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I want to handle venomous snakes. And, and, and if I get bit by them, nothing bad's going to happen with me because God is, you know, in, in, in my body uh, protecting me. The Holy Spirit is. Um, that's a religious practice. And the state saying that you can't do that is treading upon um, your religious, the exercise of your religious beliefs. The question is, is could the, it does that violate? the free exercise clause um, are there times when the state can actually prohibit a dangerous behavior even if it is a dangerous behavior that's motivated by religious beliefs we'll deal with that this week on the flip side churches are exempt from paying local property taxes that's an establishment clause case it's basically the state giving a benefit to all religious institutions who doesn't want to pay ta property taxes so in a way it's a uh, it's a support of the uh, of the religious um uh, institutions establishment clause case number five um correctional facilities must provide sweat lodges for native american prisoners that deals with the free exercise clause because native americans one of their religious practices is to go and to pray and meditate within a sweat lodge and so the state must you know provide that um ability for uh people to exercise their religious beliefs all right so that's the breakdown hopefully you did well on that so why were the framers concerned with religious liberties? Why do these religious protections end up in our founding documents? Well, there are several reasons for why that is. Uh, for one, the colonies were settled by those seeking religious freedom. So when the first, you know, settlers, uh, European settlers came to the what became the United States in the future, uh, they were escaping religious persecution. And so, as we know from your history books, Puritans came and settled on the upper eastern seaboard of what becomes the United States. Uh, and the Puritans came here because they were, um, you know, seeking uh, freedom to practice what they, how they wanted to practice Christianity. They thought that the Church of England was way too close to the Catholic Church, um, similar to it, even though it's not a part of the Catholic Church. Church, and they wanted to worship in a way that was a purer form. That's why they called themselves the, the, the Puritans, a purer form of Christianity. And plus they were persecuted in England. And so they left to, um, you know, basically freely worship in a new land. And so from early on, uh, the, the founders and those who framed the Constitution uh, were really concerned about the freedom of conscience, right? Uh, that that, that what, what our beliefs are that drive our actions, and in particular, the freedom of religious conscience and they regard you know they they regarded that as essential to being human you make the decisions about what you want to believe in terms of these big questions about the existence of god or what happens to you after you die etc they didn't want the government involved in that uh, furthermore, that um, when you look at the religious landscape of the colonies and the early states, um, they were really quite religiously diverse, but they were also pretty intolerant of re religious diversity. Um, now, let's keep it real. The religious diversity was primarily diversity within Christian sects, um, but there's a lot of diversity within Christian sect sects. And so that, um, you know, Maryland was a, a, a Catholic state, um, Pennsylvania, Quaker, uh, Virginia, Anglican, uh, you know, Massachusetts, uh, you know, uh, what became Congress Congregationalist, uh, 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 related to Puritanism, um, Baptist uh, in the lo lower uh, part of the colonies and early states. Um, and, and, you know, there were Jews, Muslims as well in the United States. So there was a lot of uh, religious diversity here, but there wasn't a lot of toleration for that, the different religions. Um, uh, Outgroups were persecuted in, in states. So if you were in an Anglican state and you were practicing Baptist, you were practicing Baptist, you, were, you know, there was going to be conflict there. States established their own religions. Um, and, and so, you know, right there, you have this sort of 
close connection between one religion and another, which can lead to conflict. Certain religions were persecuted, uh, and it was basically seen as a, a real source of conflict. And so the religious uh, protections were placed in the Constitution, not only because it's a reflection of our history in terms of seeking religious freedom, uh, but probably even more importantly, they were put in place because they, um, they were viewed as an effort to minimize conflict between religious groups. And, and basically saying everybody has a right to practice what they, what they believe. And also the state and government is not gonna get involved in taking sides with one religion over another. So the religious protections were sort of seen as a minimizer of conflict. So the religious protections that we find in the Constitution have had an impact on the landscape, the religious landscape of the United States in the past and, and today as well. And we see that impact through religious pluralism and the high level of religious affiliation that we have in the United States. You know, America was really unique in uh, its early protections for religious liberties. Very few other Western states, Western countries like the United States, um, you know, uh, had these kinds of protections. In fact, the intermingling of church and state was alive and well in Europe at this time, and very few people had protections to practice their own religious beliefs. So the, America was unique in its early protections for these religious liberties. And these protections impact the religious landscape it has in the past, but it continues to impact the religious landscape of today. If you're interested in learning more, um, you know, Google the Pew Research uh, centers a religious landscape survey. Every several years they give this very large landscape or this very large survey asking questions about what people's religious beliefs are, what their religious affiliations are. It's a great survey, particularly if you're interested in getting like a sense of what the religious landscape is in the United States. Um, you know, and the United States uh, is continues to be a country um, that is highly religious and has a high level of believing in God. Um, um, over 75% of Americans report having a religious uh, affiliation about a, uh, in, a, 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 but you know, we see a growing increase in the number of people who say that they don't have a religious affiliation. Um, but 75% of Americans, um, you know, uh, uh, are affiliate with the religion. 83% uh, of Americans believe in God. 77% um, of Americans say that religion is a really important aspect of, of their lives. Uh, and we're really more religious than other countries that are sort of like us. And uh, we'll take a look at a graph in a moment that shows that sort of uh, difference between other Western countries. Um, and so we, you know, the United States is religious. Uh, we have a higher level of religiosity than other countries that are very similar to us in terms of development and income level. Um, but we also have, uh, you know, a lot of diversity in the United States that the United States is sort of marked by religious uh, pluralism. It's overwhelmingly Christian, uh, but there's a lot of diversity within Christianity. And so a lot of people think that because you had the right to choose your religion, not have it forced on you by your government, the United States became sort of this marketplace for religious beliefs, right? People were free to go out and try to like lure adherents over to their religion. And so when you have a marketplace, there's competition and new religious ideas will develop. And so really you're going to sort of see that as we're reading these cases that have to do with the free exercise size of a relig of religion a lot of that is a product from this marketplace of religion and also the sort of rejection of these new religions that are coming about people don't like them they're not like the old religions right um, and so you know that's really a part and parcel of the religious protections that we have in our frame uh, in our founding documents a kind of a visual representation of the religious diversity in the United States is the markers that are the emblems that a person who served in the military can choose to put on their gravestone at their death. Right now, there are 74 religious emblems that are available for government um, headstones and markers through the Department of Veteran Affairs, and this is just a handful of them. Let me put on my magic pen. Uh, you know, up here, United Church of Christ, uh, the Presbyterian Cross, Cross, the Buddhist Wheel of Righteousness, Judaism, the Catholic Celtic Cross. In the middle is Native American Church of North America, which we're going to be learning about in one of our cases, Muslim, Unitarian Universalist, Mormon, the, the uh, Angel Moroni there, um, atheist, and so that's a, you know, an affiliation. Uh, here is Wicca, Wiccan, 
humanist here, the American um, African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, Sikh here, and unfortunately my face is covering the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, and so this is just a taste of visualization of all that religious um, pluralism that we have in the United States. And here's a graph that shows, I, you know, I mentioned in uh, earlier in the lecture that the United States is a lot more religious than other countries, particularly countries that are like us. Um, and this is a really cool graph. This is also from the Pew Research Foundation. And what it basically shows on this side, let me put my magic pen on. On this side of the graph, it's basically telling you the rate of religiosity within a country. And they basically measured it, and it was on a three-point scale. Uh, they basically did a, did a survey, and then they asked the survey respondents of three questions. Um, they asked them if they uh, felt that belief uh, in God is necessary to be a moral actor. They asked them whether or not religion was very important in their lives. And, and then they asked people, did you pray at least once daily? If you answered yes to all three of those questions, that you think God is necessary for morality, religion is really important to your life, you pray once a day, you got a score of three and you would be very high up on the scale here. This is the religiosity scale. Um, if you answered no to all of those questions, you would be down here. On this side, it basically shows the per capita wealth of a country, okay? Uh, in other words, that the farther you are on this side, the richer your country is. The, you know, So if you're at this end of the scale, it means you're a very poor country. If you're at this end of the scale, it means you're a very rich country, okay? And so, you know, here is some, you know, things that you, that you can sort of see um, that countries that are very poor, um, have a, a, a relatively low level of wealth, not all of them, um, but you know you could sort of see here that this is their per capita wealth. Um, they tend to have a really high level of religiosity. There's probably some reasons for that. When you're poor, your life could be really like hard and struggle and religion sort of you know offers you some solace from the material existence that may, that may not be good. Um, that when you're poor, you might be looking for a good afterlife and religion sort of provides that. But there does seem to be a correlation between religiosity, believing in God and, uh, and, 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 and having a lot of people from uh, poorer countries having a high level of religiosity. But as we see that, um, you know, the, the richer your country gets, the less religious that your country is, right? And so we see countries like Canada, uh, Sweden, Japan, um, you know, that are falling in the wealthy, but not very religious. And this is where the United States is this outlier. The United States is clearly not as religious as some countries, but it's a very wealthy country, and but it's a lot more religious than other wealthy nations. And a lot of people think that that, that difference, that, that, that we're an outlier there, there's a lot of reasons for that. But one reason might be because of the religious liberty protections that we have in our constitution. So despite the high level of religious protections that we have in the United States, religion is still a source of conflict. And as we know, we turn to the courts to settle conflicts when there are cases and controversies. And so we're going to be turning our attention to that in the two remaining slides. There's conflict over what constitutes a religion. Since uh, people who are motivated by religious belief get protections from the Constitution, um, like who determines whether or not what you believe is in fact a religion? Um, well, the Supreme Court helps us with defining what a religion is. Uh, do all religious doctrines deserve protections or just some? And is all actions motivated by religions? Should all of that be protected? Or are there times where it's justified for the government to step in and say, you know what, you can't engage in that behavior or that action, even though it's religiously motivated. Um, so in the next lecture, we're going to tackle uh, these uh, uh, two of these, try to answer two of these questions. Uh, we're going to look at the way the court has defined religion. And then we're also going to talk about this thing that the Supreme Court has created. It's called the belief action distinction. What the court says is that you can believe whatever you want, but when you put your beliefs into action, that's when the, the government can sometimes be justified in curtailing your religious actions or practice. All right, that's it for right now. And I'll talk to you again soon in lecture number two.